Today we are going to talk about a topic that is not talked about and it is the connection between Egypt and the rise of the Antichrist or the Anti-Mashiach, the Anti-Messiah. I would strongly suggest that you invite a lot of people to watch what you're going to hear today you probably have never heard before. I do hope that you prepared as you watched that video that I sent to prepare you and that particular link over there over that video of how well two years ago mummies were 22 mummies embalmed mummies of ancient pharaohs were actually transported from their tombs into or the mausoleums into a newly built museum in cairo you're going to learn throughout this broadcast how Egypt is building a nearly finished building, a new administrative capital that has the largest cathedral in the world and the largest mosque in the world and a very large synagogue as well. How the interfaith movement is connected with all of this and that includes Catholics and Evangelical Christians of all sorts and even Israelis. We're going to learn all of these things and how that this connects with all the different prophecies in the Bible. So first of all, for those that have been really watching the news, you probably know that on Passover this year, Israel was attacked from Gaza, exactly on Passover night. Now, while there's been many attacks from Gaza, I don't think that most people have paid attention about the timing. We need to realize that the enemy is most particular about the signs that he also gives. The timing of uh, beginning to attack Israel again on Passover night is a very profound and prophetic timing for the connection between Egypt and the rise of the anti-Messiah. Now, I would like to also take the name Egypt in Hebrew, which is Mitzrayim, and I will take the name of Jerusalem, original name is Yerushalayim. And you can, you can see that there is a connection in the ending of both names, Mitzrayim, Yerushalayim. What does it mean? Mitzrayim means the place of a double portion of trouble or distress. The place of a double portion of trouble and distress. Yerushalayim means the place or the possession, uh, the inheritance of double portion of shalom or well-being. So we can see there are two opposing forces here. Even in the names, Mitzrayim, the place of double portion trouble or distress, and Yerushalayim, the place or of the inheritance of a double portion of shalom and well-being. So, as we deal with all of this, I want you to keep those names in mind because it will be very meaningful to understand what is really happening, what will be happening, and who wins at the end. But before we get all over there, I want to talk about Passover. You see, in Passover, the whole story of the Exodus is so powerful. And during that story, we talk about 10 plagues, 10 plagues that the God of Israel sent against the Egyptians, the Mitzrim, to be able to cause Pharaoh's heart 
finally to release the Israelites from the land of Egypt, except it was God himself that hardened Pharaoh's heart. We need to keep that in mind. And the purpose was very clear. It was to glorify his name. So let's read first and foremost this. And the first thing that I'm going to read will be from Exodus 10. And I'm going to read 1 and 2. And it says this, Then Yahweh said to Moshe, or Moses, Go to Pharaoh, because I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, so that I might show these my signs in their midst. And so you may tell your son and your grandchildren what I've done in Mitzrayim, in Egypt, as well as my signs that I did among them, so you may know that I'm Yahweh. So we see here that in the Exodus story of Passover, which is going to, and it's trying to be replayed back now in this end of times, so you're going to understand by the end of the broadcast why I'm saying that, with exactly the same areas, Mitzrayim, Egypt, and, and Israel, the land of Canaan, and the Israelites, the Jewish people of today, we're going to deal with all of that. But it says here that Yahweh hardened the heart of Pharaoh in order that he can display his signs for the purpose of glorifying his name so that actually uh, he will be glorified and that our children and our grandchildren, Israelite Jewish children and grandchildren, will keep on retelling the story and remembering all the signs that Yahweh did against Egypt when he defeated Egypt and all of our gods. 10 of them uh, during that time, okay? During the time of the Exodus. And the purpose was that, that you may know that I'm Yahweh. In other words, that the Israelites, the Jewish people of today, will know that he's Yahweh. But not only that, not only that. Let's go to Exodus 14, 4. And this is after the 10 plagues are sent, all the 10 plagues that deal, every one of them deals with another God in Egypt, like for example, the blood on the Nile, because they worship the Nile, ending with the death of the firstborn, the firstborn of Pharaoh, all the way to the servant girl, because the firstborn of Pharaoh was actually the heir to the throne, and Pharaoh was regarded as the God of Egypt. That's right. In fact, the saying was that Pharaoh was Egypt and Egypt was Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was the God of Egypt. The moment that you destroyed the firstborn of Pharaoh and all the other firstborn, then technically you destroyed all of Egypt. But wasn't that enough for God? Because at the end, when finally the Israelites, uh, you know, leave Egypt, plunder the Egyptians with silver and gold, Hallelujah, because he said, go and uh, you plunder the Egyptians. And they did. They went out with the quantity of silver and gold and the wealth of Egypt. But not only that, finally, when they come in front of the Red Sea, you didn't think God knew it. Of course he knew it. They come in front of the Red Sea. Yah brings them there. He puts a pillar of cloud and of fire between them and the Egyptians. Finally, the Egyptians notice that the Israelites are in front of of the Red Sea, and the Red Sea opens up when Moses lifts up his staff, two walls, one on the side, right side, the left, and east wind opens that sea, and the Israelites begin to cross on dry ground, and the Egyptians come right after them. The Israelites manage to get out of the sea, the Egyptians get into the sea, and when all the Egyptians, and it says that all of the armies of Egypt, 600 chariots of the choice chariots of the officers of Egypt, plus all the other chariots, plus all the might and the army of Egypt, comes in the middle of the Red Sea. Yahweh restores the waters by Moses lifting up his staff, restoring the waters, and all of the Egyptian army actually is drowned on the Red Sea. In other words, not only does he deal with all of the ten gods of Egypt, and the land of Egypt, and the cattle, and everything that Egyptians owned at the time, but also with the military might of Egypt. Now, most people do not know that actually the Six-Day War, which we call the miraculous Six-Day War, was all about Egypt. They do not know that the war was won by Israel after the first, not six days, after the first six minutes of the war, when the, Isra the Israelis destroyed the entire fleet of airplanes of Egypt. In other words, all the military might was destroyed in the first six minutes. Therefore, we understand what happened when Asad comes, meets with Begin, and we thought this was such an amazing happening and whatnot. But there was an agenda also behind, or maybe Assad was played and manipulated, maybe Begin was played and manipulated, we do not know that at this point. But we do know that the Egyptians made peace with Israel because they couldn't defeat Israel. 
That's the only reason. Because Israel had won the war the first six minutes, destroying all the military might of Egypt through the Air Force of Egypt. Because the moment you don't have an Air Force, then the military might is pretty much destroyed because there's no covering even for the infantry to walk in. And so that's important for us to remember that right now. But you see, why did Yah destroy all the might of Egypt? Let's find out. And why is he going to do it again? Because we're going to find out the connection between the rise of Egypt, the rise of the new administrative capital, the uh, transference of the 22 mummies of ancient pharaohs into a new, uh, the new museum of Egypt that will be visited by millions and millions and millions of people to draw them into the ancient worship of the foreign god Ra and Baal and other different foreign gods. Why is this so important? Let's read in Exodus 14, verse 4. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Again, we can see that the one that calls the shots is the God of Israel. It's not the Pharaohs of this world. It's not Satan. It's not the fallen gods. It's the God of Israel, even when the hearts of Pharaohs are hardened. So let's pay attention. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. So he will follow after them, after the Israelites. Then I will be glorified over Pharaoh along with all his army and the Mitzrayim, the Egyptians, will know that I'm Yahweh. So they did so, Exodus 14, 4. Ha. So what's the purpose that he destroyed all of Egypt and all the military might? The purpose was so that the Egyptians will know that he is Yahweh. What's the purpose that he sent 10 plagues the purpose was so that the Israelites will know that he is Yahweh. So we can see here that Yahweh is dealing with the Egyptians. He's dealing with the Israelites. And the purpose of all of this display of power is that they will know that he is Yahweh. Now the question is, is this connected with something that the Bible tells us about? Absolutely. We can go to Isaiah 19 and check it out. And we are going to check it out in a moment. But before we do that, I'm going to ask a few questions. Because we're going to deal with the chapter of Isaiah 19 that deals with the end of times and the happenings of the end of times and what I would call the true plan for peace in the Middle East. You thought that the Abraham's Accords was a plan for peace? Oh, my friends, then sorry, but you have bought into a deception. Because the plan of the Abraham's Accord is exactly for the purpose of getting Israel to be set up into the biggest and worst trap. And therefore, it is absolutely not a coincidence that right now we have uh, bin Salman, which is, you know, the, 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 the prince of Saudi, went to Iran and they're beginning to make uh, a special covenant between them, an alliance between them. And you know that at the end of the day, the purpose of the alliance is the annihilation and destruction of Israel. So honestly, to be honest with you, all of this stuff of these special accords and even trying to get one with Saudi Arabia and all of that, the purpose that lies behind it is Hitler's child. For that, you need to watch that particular video and eventually it's the annihilation of Israel. Any accord that is made with our enemies, that involves stopping settling the land of Israel, causing Israelites to actually retreat from the settlement of the entire land, from the Nile to the Euphrates, and especially land that has been won by war because the war was never started by Israel, but was started by the 10 Arab nations that attacked Israel, and Israel was outnumbered. And in spite of that, in the first six minutes, Israel destroyed all the fleet of Egypt. And on top of it, within six days, Israel had completely won the war, to the point where even the Israeli flag was flying over the Dome of the Rock. But our... Uh, uh, Minister of Defense at the time, Moshe Dayan, was a humanist, secular humanist. Everybody thinks he was an amazing hero. Uh, I think that he made the most vile mistake of Israel's life, and it was basically to go ahead and to play the game of the Muslims, and he went ahead and he uh, uh, made a, a covenant with Islam. How did he make it? Because he gave the waqf, the Muslim authorities' autonomy over the Temple Mount, where the Temple Mount had been given to Israel on a silver platter by the God of Israel. Temple Mount, the place where the first temple was, the second temple was, the third temple will be, and Yeshua will rule and reign from there with a rod of iron over all the nations of the world. So he made a tactic mistake. It's cost us a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, because it's been so many years passed through the 1967 war, and, and, and now we are back on square one here, and Egypt is arising not only as a, 
as a power because really Egypt as a people is pretty destroyed. We're going to talk about this maybe as well. But Egypt as a people is destroyed, is plundered, is an abused people, is an oppressed people. But the government of Egypt that is now led by Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, al that he actually took the government by force. He was not elected as the president of Egypt. It was a military coup. And he took the government by force, and that al-Sisi has deliriums of grandeur. But he has deliriums of grandeur in the same way uh, that uh, uh, the president of Iran has deliriums of grandeur, and the same way that Erdogan, the president of Turkey, has deliriums of grandeur. All these places where ancient empires were, like the ancient Persian Empire, like the ancient um, Ottoman Empire or Turkish Empire, and now the ancient Egyptian Empire, all of these are in cahoots together with deliriums of grandeur to be the ones to rule the earth on top of all of these two the highest one is actually the one from Egypt why because the Bible tells us about something that's going to happen in Egypt and because the origins of all the troubles actually came from Egypt the origin of idolatry and 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 demon worship all the Egyptian culture is the culture that uh, the people that worship all these different gods and idols and fallen gods, they always relate to the Egyptian culture. For example, in the midst of Washington disease, 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 hmm, diseased, um, lies, you know, I, I don't make pro mistakes. Eh? This, this is prophetic mistakes, diseased. You see, there is a, um, an obelisk. There's the Washington Memorial and there's the obelisk. And that obelisk, beloved ones, is an Egyptian obelisk, completely aligning the United States of America with Egyptian culture and the Egyptian gods that are the ones that are being now honored as those 22 mummies of the pharaohs. All the pharaohs have been transferred to a museum that many people will want to honor worship and visit mm. and Abdel Fattah al-Sisi believes that he's going to become the god of Egypt he's the president now but he's been establishing this administrative capital that is over 200 miles big that lies between the edge of Cairo and the start of Alexandria so we are dealing with quite a huge place over there and they, he has been building the highest everything, and the biggest, biggest pyramid, crystal pyramid, the tallest one and the tallest building in all of Africa. And of course, the biggest cathedral, the biggest mosque and a big, not maybe the biggest, but a big, if not the biggest synagogue in uniting all the religions together to bow down to the God of Egypt. And the God of Egypt is none other than the sun God Ra. Okay, so is Egypt, the president of Egypt, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, wants to reverse history? Does he want to reverse the Exodus story? Yes, he does. He wants to reverse the Exodus story because Satan wants to reverse the Exodus story. The anti-Messiah wants to reverse the Exodus story. They don't like the ending. It's not happy ending for them. So they want to reverse the Exodus story where all the gods were defeated at that time. And he wants to put the gods in charge again and defeat the God of Israel. Quite presumptuous, don't you think? I mean, the creator of the universe. Yes, Al-Sisi is trying to reverse history. While his people are groaning and suffering, Al-Sisi, the deliriums of grandeur, is actually becoming the head of the globalists of the world. So now I'm going to ask you some questions. Are the globalists worshipping the ancient gods involved in defying the God of Israel and aligning themselves with ancient Egypt that was defeated together with their ten gods and their military in the biblical event of the Exodus? And the answer is yes, they are aligned with Egypt. As I said, all the way from Washington DC with the Egyptian obelisk and all around the world. Another one in Paris, what not. Are we about to see a display of Yahweh's power plaguing Egypt and all those aligned with them, including all nations in the UN that have attacked Israel and its right to the land? 
And yes, we are going to see this happening again. He is going to plague all of the nations that have come against Israel and that have aligned themselves with Egypt and its new administrative capital where the ancient pharaohs are worshipped and with it the ancient gods of Egypt. Yes, he will. The Bible is clear about this. In fact, if you go to Isaiah 34 um, and you see from verse 1 to verse 8 it says that he's going he has already destroyed all of the nations he's already given them all to the slaughter and in verse 8 it says because Yahweh has a day of vengeance because of the hostility the enmity against Zion against Israel I could really touch on a lot more verses than that and show you how all the stormy weather and the storms that are happening in America are totally connected with uh, Mr. Biden coming against Israel and its right to the land and trying to stop the hands of the government of Israel to pass the judicial reform but that would be for another broadcast but right now I want you to understand that the God of Israel is already plaguing Turkey plaguing the nations plaguing Iran and even plaguing Egypt because what is happening happening right now is of course exactly what Satan did and said all the way in Isaiah 14 and in Ezekiel 28 when he says I will rise up above uh, the congregate the uh, altar of the congregation I will rise up above the stars of God which are the children of Israel so so yes we're gonna see the showdown of the ages beloved and you'd better dress Hold onto your seat, put the seat belt on because you're going to see it. And the question is on what side of the equation you're going to be. Because, you know, I, I don't just do broadcast to inform you. I do broadcast because I'm expecting those of you that love the God of Israel and love Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, to actually choose sides. That's right. Are you going to be on the side of the God of Israel or on the side of the God of Egypt? That's the question. Now, the good news is that at the end of the show, Israel, but there's going to be a story until that happens. And that's good news, especially for our Egyptian brothers and sisters in the land of Egypt, if they play right. In other words, if they rebuke, renounce, expose, and reject replacement theology in all of its aspects. Because if they do not expel replacement theology from the church in Egypt, then all of those that are still steeped in replacement theology are going to automatically be aligned with Egypt. Because replacement theology is aligned with Babylon and Egypt is aligned with Babylon. It's exactly the same ancient God. And because all of the worship within Christianity is borrowed from the Greco-Roman pantheon of foreign gods and fallen angels, and that includes the Christmas and the Easter and the Sunday worship and all of these things, whether you're under Valentine's Day and the New Year's Eve, and you name them, all of them, and the Lupercalia, which is uh, the Valentine's Day I already mentioned, and, and Halloween, of course, uh, uh, that is all the day of witchcraft and the day of the dead. All of these things have been borrowed from either the Greco-Roman pantheon or from druid worship in the area of Ireland, for example, okay? And so what's going to happen is that Egypt actually gathers all of these and worships the sun god. And so all of these are completely, all these celebrations are around the sun god. Even if we dress them, we give them other meanings, it doesn't matter what meanings we put on them. The traditions and the dates are completely connected and often the names completely connected to the fallen angels and to the foreign gods. So until the church of Egypt doesn't actually repent, do Teshuvah to get out all of these foreign gods from their midst, they already are aligning with the foreign gods of Egypt because they are already aligned with sun worship. And by the way, that goes to all of the Christians in the world. That's the reason why in my book, The Healing Power of the Roots, I wrote clearly about the answer of God about this when I told him, what's the big deal about preaching a of the Jewish roots to the church. And Yahweh said to me, it's a matter of life and death because the church has been like a beautiful rose cut off from her garden for two days. But on the third day, if she's not replanted back, she will surely die. The first day is like one day is like a thousand years to Yahweh. Two days, two thousand years. The third day is the third millennium. We're in the third millennium. And anyone in the church that is still aligned with the foreign worship feasts of the sun, God and others will fall directly 
into the system of the anti-Messiah. And it is a matter of life and death right now. And there is no mincing of words of that. So the question is, I asked you some questions. Now I'm going to ask one more question here. Are Christians aligned with the rising of Egypt? Is the U.S. connected with these happenings that defy the God of Israel? Well, we already showed you that the U.S. is completely connected with that. And uh, the obelisk in, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. shows us clearly that the alignment is with the Egyptian culture and the Egyptian gods. So the U.S. is already connected. And unless we come out of that culture, hallelujah, and we come out of all replacement theology in the church, we're going to fall directly into the worship of the gods of Egypt, even though we will have good meanings or we mean well, we want to do well. It doesn't matter what it is. God will not, it's not palatable to the most high God. So, um, so is the church? Yes, it's connected. Let me tell you that there was uh, in November of 2022, quite a happening on Mount Sinai. Well, on what people accept as Mount Sinai today. And there were all sort of climate activists that went up on Mount Sinai together with Catholic Christians, Evangelical Christians, and Israelis. All of them gathered together on top of Mount Sinai with two tablets of what they call the Ten Commandments or the New Ten Commandments, a replacement Ten Commandments that are all connected with the weather, climatic commandment or the ecology of the weather. They went on top of that Mount Sinai and I had even a very good friend of mine that was going to be part of this event and taking part in this event thinking he was going to dismantle it by his actions. But when he came to me and he told me I've been invited to be part of this globalist event, I told him do not dare. Because the moment that you come in their midst to agree with that event, even though you think you're going to dismantle it, and you put yourself to uh, use the weapon of warfare that Yahweh has given you to bow down to this event, then technically you have aligned yourself with the rise of Egypt and the anti-Messiah and with the gods of Egypt and with the sun god and everything that they are espousing. Now, just to let you know something, on top of that Mount Sinai, in November, I believe it was 13th of November, 2022, not long ago, right? They broke down the two tablets of these false Ten Commandments, mimicking what Moses did when he came out from the mountain and the people had gone to do orgies with, you know, the golden calf. So when Moses comes down and he sees all the people of Israel incited by the mixed rubble that was in the midst of them, all kinds of people from different nations that were used to the foreign worship of foreign gods, and they were very unhappy that Moses went up there and he didn't return in 40 days. And finally they went and with the Israelites, they convinced Aaron to go ahead, convince, I'd say coerce, and Aaron was weak of character and he went ahead and he built a golden calf with their gold that they had taken out of Egypt. And so Moses comes, he breaks the Ten Commandments in wrath and he, may, he then pulverizes the golden calf and makes them drink it. And then he goes right back up again to intercede for Israel so that Yahweh will not destroy the whole nation. And he stays 40 more days and comes down with two new tablets of the commandments, the Ten Commandments of the Ten Words, which is a reminiscent and a type and a shadow of what would come later, which is the New Covenant, because there were two times that the Ten Commandments came down. Ten Commandments came down first time and they were broken, and the Ten Commandments came the second time, they were not broken, they were put in the Ark of the Covenant, in the same way that any one of us that worships the God of Israel through Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, then we have the Torah written inside of our heart, because that's the New Covenant. Hallelujah. Yeshua is the word made flesh. What word? The Torah made flesh. And uh, Jeremiah 31, from verse 31 to 34 in your English Bible, in the Hebrews 30, um, it says that this is the new covenant that Yahweh will do with the people of Israel, the people of Judah. He will write, or the house of Israel, the house of Judah, he will write his Torah in our hearts. In other words, we will be the Ark of the Covenant and the Torah will be written inside of us. Second time Moses comes down, was kind of pointing us to the new covenant or the Brit Hadashah, where the Torah will be inside of the Ark and we are the Ark. 
praise the living yah that we meaning those uh, jews and gentiles that are joined together grafted into the same olive tree not worshiping sun god and worshiping all kinds of feasts but worshiping the god of israel in holiness and righteousness we have the torah inside of us as the ark of the covenant so the thing is that Christians that do not have the Torah in their hearts because they've rejected the law, the law, they keep on rejecting the laws of God. I didn't say to be under the law, I said to be in the law because Yeshua is the law. Yeshua is the word of God. Yeshua is the Torah made flesh. So obviously his spirit will write the Torah and what pleases Yah inside of our hearts. Hallelujah. And therefore he will write in our hearts that he is displeased with worshiping the sun God through all kinds of Christian feasts that are dressed as if they were holy, but they are not. So, you know, if we have the Torah written in our heart, then the conscious will begin to work and we will begin to know. The Holy Spirit will begin to work and we will begin to know, no, no, this is displeasing to the God of Israel. And in fact, it was this exact thing, this replacement theology that broke away from the Jewish roots of the faith and it broke away exactly on the feast of Passover. In other words, the breaking away of Christianity from the original Jewish foundations of faith, from the original Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, into a Greek Christ, from the original Moadim and biblical feast into pagan feast, that actually unleashed the most anti-Semitism against the Jews, killing the Jews in the name of Christ. Oh my gosh. There's so many of these events, but just to mention a few would be, you know, the, the crusade, the Spanish Inquisition, and the Shoah, the Nazi Holocaust, and the pogroms all over Russia and the East uh, part of Europe. Uh, but I, I could really say a lot more about this. But again, that would be for another broadcast. And you can watch a lot of my videos about this subject, uh, especially the non-negotiables really suggest that you do that. But hallelujah. So what happens is that when we really are in the Jewish Messiah, that then we will have this conviction. But the breaking away of the Christians from the original Jewish Messiah happened exactly on the issue of Passover, when Passover or Pesach, passing over because of the blood, was and the whole Exodus story was replaced for the goddess Ishtar, for Easter. And from that moment, the date of the goddess Ishtar was adopted and the traditions of the goddess Ishtar was adopted. And so in the Council of Nicaea, it's written, let us therefore separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jews, for the for uh, the 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 Christ or the Savior has showed us another way, another way following our calculations and not the calculations of the Jews. Another way choosing the celebration of Ishtar or Easter up uh, uh, besides or in, instead replacing the celebration of Pesach or Passover. So we can see that that rebellion against the God of Israel and that rebellion overturning or reversing the Exodus story already began to happen in the fourth century with the Council of Nicaea through Emperor Constantine and the Christian bishops al aligned themselves with him. And then it has affected all of Christianity until today. I have no doubt that there's many people that belong to the Bride of Messiah within every Christian denomination, including Catholic. However, you'd better come out of that system. Because if you don't come out of that system, you're going to swallow by that system and you're going to go there. In the same way that everything that has happened with the latest plague caused people to be under the pressure of taking all these jobs and things like that. And that is connected with the preparation for the mark of the beast. And so when we do not have the Torah written in our heart, what happens is that we're going to take the preparation of the mark of the beast. And we are also going to take the mark of the beast because it is just convenient because the whole religion of Christianity that developed from the fourth century and on is a religion of convenience, not of obedience to the God of Israel, of convenience in the midst of the Roman world. You want to know more about it? Please go ahead, check all of my videos and get enlightened on my book, The Identity Theft, which will change your life, transform it, and every Christian should read it in the face of the earth so that you will be prepared for what is to come. Back to Egypt. Back to Egypt. So who was on top of Mount Sinai breaking the false, fake, replacement te Ten Commandments? Uh, because of the weather or the climatic things, that was Christians. Who wrote those Ten Commandments? Well, the first time that those Ten Commandments of climate were uh, written, replacement, the Ten Commandments in the Bible, was by Pope Benedict. And then uh, Pope, uh, Pope Francis kind of revised them. And then they were brought up on Mount Sinai with evangelicals lining up, and saying, well, you know, God, of course, 
we, we are stewards of the earth, so we need to deal with the climate, we need to take care of the climate issues, and we need to make sure that humanity repents from abusing creation, the creation. And so they begin to quote the Bible on these things. Now, while there is a seed of truth in that, because in every deception there is always a seed of truth. Satan only takes the word, perverts it, and then gives it to us to eat. Well, whoever wants to eat the word that he gives, that is. And so in this case, we have evangelical Christians, Catholic Christians, and Israelis lined up on top of Mount Sinai, breaking fake Ten Commandments, declaring a new era for all of the globe. Whereabout we're going to really take care of the earth and rescue the earth. Well, I don't know about that, because if you go to the book of Revelation, you're going to see that the rescue of the earth is not going to happen. In fact, you go to Revelation 7, and it says that uh, there is going to be um, hail mixed with blood and fire, and uh, locust and all of that, and, and a third of the earth and all the green trees and green pastures are going to be destroyed by the judgment and the wrath of God. So it doesn't matter how much the globalists are trying to rescue the earth with their globalist agenda of climatic change and replacing the Ten Commandments of God, whether it be Christians that do it or Israelis that do it, I, I can tell you at the end of the day, at the end of the day, <clears throat> a third of the earth is going to be destroyed, whatever they do. The thing is that people are worshiping creation instead of the creator. Romans 1 tells us clearly that the people are worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And that's exactly what the globalists espouse. And that's also how Egypt comes into the picture. Hallelujah. So we have a new administrative capital in Egypt. The mum is being transferred to the new museum. The new capital goes all the way from Cairo to Alexandria, which is at the Mediterranean Sea. And on top of it, we have fake Ten Commandments broken on the top of Mount Sinai with uh, an unholy alliance between Catholic Christians, Evangelical Christians, other globalists, and Israelis. Wow, amazing. Not all Israelis, just Israelis that espouse it. I assure you that those that believe in the importance of the land of Israel and the Ten Commandments among the religious Zionist Jews were not there. But there were other Israelis that do not really believe in the Ten Commandments, therefore they believe in the Ten Climatic Commandments that the Pope called for, but not in the Ten Commandments that the God of Israel called for. Now, one more thing that I need to put into the mix and the equation is that this guy, the president of Egypt, Mitzrayim, Mr. Al-Sisi, Abdel Fattah Al-Sisi, okay, what a name. Well, anyway, this man, he actually has proclaimed himself literally to be the Pope of Egypt. And I'm going to explain why. Because he said he answers to no one but to God alone. In other words, he doesn't give any accountability. The people of Egypt are dying of starvation. They are hit with every kind of problem and disease. They are poor like a mice. And yet this president says that he's spending all these billions of dollars to build this new administrative capital instead of blessing his people. He doesn't care at all for the people of Egypt. That God himself wants to displace power to destroy all of this wicked system that tries to reenact the exodus in reverse so that the people of Egypt will know that he is Yahweh, not Allah, not Ra, not the sun god, not Al-Sisi that is answerable to God. Which god? That's a good question, isn't it? Answerable to God alone. Well, we know which god it is. It's a fallen god uh, by the name of the sun god, Jupiter, Ra, Abel, Ela, Allah. You can call him whatever you want to call him. It still goes all the way to Satan. So now, I know I kind of painted the picture. It doesn't look too good, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. Because that's where the rise of the anti-Messiah is coming from. From Egypt. Now, Egypt has been used in the past to bless Israel. How? Because when Yosef, Joseph, was sold to the Egyptians, he rose to prominence in Egypt and he became the number one financier of the empire. And because of that prominence, 
And then all of the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the family of Jacob could actually emigrate to, to Egypt for the purpose of rescuing life during a time of famine in Canaan. Because of all the idolatry and the worship of foreign gods in Canaan, there was a famine. Understand, people, every time you see a, a famine coming, it's because of idolatry, okay? It's idolatry and the foreign worship of God in Canaan. Then they were transported to Egypt by Joseph himself, who took care of them in the land of Goshen. It's one of my best prayers in the end of times. Lord, make us like the land of Goshen, where all the plagues are happening all around, but us, we are protected like the land of Goshen was protected. And so Joseph brings all of the family to Egypt, and therefore we grow up to become the nation that is literally rescued from the slavery of Egypt to come out and become the nation of Israel with 600,000 men plus women and children that came out of Egypt. And so Egypt was used to preserve and to grow the nation of Israel. During the time of Joseph, it was a great time for the Israelites and for the sons of Jacob. But after Joseph died, there was a Pharaoh that rose up that didn't know Joseph, and he enslaved all the children of Israel, and therefore God rose up Moses that was raised in the courts of Pharaoh to set the, Egyptian, to, to set the Israelites free. So that is the story in a nutshell. Hallelujah. So Egypt was used to grow, to preserve the nation of Israel. And Yahweh remembers that. And then on top of it, Yahweh remembers one more thing, that when Herod decided to murder all the little children, the boys from two years old and less, so that he could find and murder the Messiah, Joseph, again, another Joseph, and it looks like a very popular name for these kind of things connecting with Egypt. So another Joseph, the earthly father of Yeshua, not the a real father, because the real father was, we know, the Elohim of Israel, the God of Israel who planted the seed in the womb of Miriam that was a virgin. And as written in the prophet Isaiah clearly that the virgin will give birth to a son and will be called Emmanuel, Elohim Itanu, or God is with us. Anyways, Joseph, the earthly father, the one that was the caretaker of the Messiah and who adopted him as a son, he is visited in a dream to move to Egypt with the son and with Miriam, the mother, in order to rescue him from the clutches of Herod. And they stay in Egypt for as long as Herod is alive. When Herod dies, then Yahweh visits Joseph again and tells him, now you can go back to Israel. They go to Nazareth, where the family of Joseph was from and the family of Miriam. Yeshua is raised in Nazareth and eventually until he is 30 years old when he's released to his three and a half years of ministry on the earth before he's crucified, put on the ground, rises from the dead on the third day, and he fulfills the prophecies given in Isaiah 53 to become that lamb, the Passover lamb for us. So you can see that all of it is about Passover. He, even the salvation that we enjoy is all about Passover. So. What am I going to say, therefore? Because Egypt is connected with preserving life of the nation of Israel and even of the Messiah of Israel. And because the Messiah of Israel spends a few years in Egypt, then Yahweh is going to rescue the people of Egypt. From what? From their own demonic empire that is being built right now, the anti-Messiah empire built in Egypt right now in that new administrative capital. So Yahweh is going to rescue the people of Egypt, but not without a cost. It's going to be a terrible cost for those that are not going to be on the side of the God of Israel. Many will die. But those that are on the side of the God of Israel may suffer as well, but at least they will suffer for a good cause and eventually they will enjoy eternal life. So let's take a look at this. And I'm going to read chapter is there 19. So bear with me, open your Bibles, please give time to the word of God. I mean, people give so much time to the news and they want to hear every tidbit of news. Well, the news I'm telling you are happening today, but they're also prophesied in the Bible. Let's take a look. So here's Isaiah 19. We're going to read the entire chapter. The burden of Egypt, Mitzrayim, the prophet Isaiah writes to us. Behold, Yahweh rides upon a swift cloud and comes to Egypt. Egypt's idols tremble before him. Watch it happen, please. 
Egypt's idols in the new administrative capital will tremble. In fact, many, many evil events happened when the mummies were transferred to the new, the 22 mummies, um, ball mummies of the pharaohs were transferred. There was horrendous things, trains derailing and all kinds of sewage being spilled in the midst of Cairo. And a lot of difficult things happened during the time of the transference of the mummies. The Egypt's idols tremble before him. And that's something we're going to pray. Father, let Egypt's idols tremble before you. And Egypt's heart melts within them. I will stir up Egyptian against Egyptian. Do you see a civil war here? I will stir up Egyptian against Egyptian. Well, that figures, I'll tell you why. Because this Al-Sisi is building up the empire in this new capital city to become the anti-Messiah globalist of the world. And at the same time, his people are suffering and groaning. So that is a ticket for a civil war. Egyptian against Egyptian. Everyone will fight against his brother and everyone against his neighbor, even Christians, and especially Christians that are steeped in replacement theology, Christianity, they are going to be fighting as well, each other, because they're still steeped with those gods of Babylon that are aligned with the gods of Egypt, which is the same same God. City against city, kingdom against kingdom, the spirit of Egypt will drain within it. And I will confuse its counsel. How should we pray? Father, confuse the council of Egypt. Let me tell you that what happened in this Passover, where Israel was attacked from Gaza with rockets on Passover evening, comes from Egypt. Why? Because at the border of Gaza is Rafiah and is Egypt. And Egypt is the one that is calling the shots, even of Hamas. And even though we have a peace with Egypt, believe me, that's not true. We have a peace with Egypt on paper. But Egypt has been working under the ground to be able to manipulate Hamas in Gaza in the same way that the president of Iran has been working under the ground and above ground to manipulate Syria and Lebanon, the Hezbollah in Syria, in, in Lebanon, to, to attack Israel. Every time it's attacked Israel, it's Iran and Egypt that are attacking Israel. When there are rockets fired from Gaza, it's not those poor Palestinians that are so... No, because when Gush Katif, the, set, the Jewish settlements in Gaza were there with the amazing hothouses, the Gazans had jobs. And the Jews were taking care of the well-being of those Palestinians or Arabs in Gaza. No Palestinians, it's an invention. The Arabs in Gaza were being taken care of. Many were coming out to work in the fields of the Israelis. And they were bringing food on the table of their children. And there wasn't custom rockets being sent from there. Because all this area was beautiful, <coughs> gorgeous, um, what do you call it, um, beautiful hothouses. Mm. With organic vegetables. It was the best. I got to eat them. It was wonderful. Brought my people there. Intercessor was great. So the truth is that any time that Hamas fires a rocket, believe me, Egypt is behind it. Why do you think that they always call Egypt to be the broker of the Hudna? Because they call it um, peace or they call it um, ceasefire. But in Arabic, that is called Hudna. Hudna means we're going to have a ceasefire when our enemy is strong. And when we become stronger than they, we're going to start the war again so that, uh, you know, we, we win. So it's actually a coward's ceasefire. It's a ceasefire to become stronger so that they can attack back again. And who is the broker of all those hoodnas? Egypt. So Egypt is behind all of that. So anytime that you see all these rockets being sent, Egypt is behind it. Okay, good. I've just dispelled the myth. So let's go and take a look at this. I will confuse its council. Make sure you do confuse the council of Sisi and all of his comrades. Yes, I didn't say comrades for nothing. Okay, all of his comrades, just go ahead and confuse their council in prayer. So they will resort to idols, 
which they are already. That's why they transfer all these 22 mummies and they're worshiping the God Ra and they're lifting up all these cathedrals of religions and everything so that they can worship every God that they can worship, like the Tower of Babel, really. So they will resort to idols, charmers, mediums, and familiar spirits. That's exactly what's happening in Egypt right now. That's exactly what's happening in that administrative capital right now. That's why this large, largest, tallest, crystal pyramid built in this place the biggest one in africa i will give the egyptians and by the way egypt is the gate to africa okay keep that in mind too because you're going to watch africa i will give the egyptians into the hand of a cruel master well let me tell you that's already happened because sisi didn't take didn't get the power from elections he got it from a military coup and he has become a cruel master. He's plundering the people. He's using all the billions to build his administrative capital where he answers to God only, which God we don't know, we, we do know, the sun God. He answers to Ra only, and his people are dying. So that already has happened. They are under a cruel master. A fierce king will rule over them. He's already declared himself to be king and not president. Because only kings answer to God only. So he's a king, not a president. And he's a fierce king that rules over them. In fact, he doesn't absolutely take them into consideration. He does not have any care for his own people. It is a declaration of Yahweh Tzavah. So we see this happening already here. Now, let's take a look at what's going to happen. The waters from the sea will dry up and the river Nile will be drained dry. Then the channels will stink. It's already happening. The streams of Egypt will dwindle and dry up. Reeds and rushes will rot. The bulrushes by the Nile, by the mouth of the Nile, and everything sown by the Nile will wither, blow away, and be no more. Do you see a famine here? Then the fishermen will lament. Whole hooks in the Nile will mourn, and those who spread nets on the waters will languish. Moreover, the workers of fine flax and the weavers of white cloth will be ashamed. Her pillars will be crushed. All hired workers will be grieved in soul. The princes of Zoan are utter fools. Pharaoh's wisest counselors are stupid. So all these wise counselors of Egypt that broke peace or a hudna, a ceasefire between Israel and Gaza, those, it says, are stupid counselors, foolish counselors, because they do not fear the God of Israel and worship the Son God, Ra. How can you say to Pharaoh, I'm the son of the wise, a son of ancient kings? And that's what is saying. I'm the son of the wise. I'm the son of this... 22 embalmed pharaohs that I've just moved to my museum. Where then are your wise men? Let them tell you now. Let them know what Yavetz Vaot has purpose against Egypt. Now let's listen because this is exactly what's going to happen. In the same way that he purposed to restore Israel back to his land and give us back the land that he promised to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob for 1,000 uh, generations and that all the way from the Nile to the Euphrates then what is written here will happen for Beidim. Nobody can deny that after 2,000 years of Israel, the Jewish people are back to their land. Undeniable fact. Never happened before to any nation with the same language. It was a desert and now it's a blooming uh, Garden of Eden in many areas where it was desert. So it says this, the princes of Zoan are fools. The princes of Noph are deceived. The cornerstone of her tribes have led Egypt astray. Yahweh has mixed within her a spirit of dizziness. They make Egypt stagger in every work as a drunkard staggered in his vomit. There will be no work for Egypt to do for head or tail, palm, brush or rush. In that day, Egypt will be like women trembling with fear because of the shaking hand of Yahweh Tzavaot, which is about to wave over it. And there were so many wicked happenings and terrible happenings within Egypt when they moved the mummies that people began to say 
that it is the curse of the mummies that has come upon Egypt for moving them. But then a major minister said, oh, people are saying that, but it's not true. The, trans the transferring of these mummies actually is very important for Egypt to restore Egypt's dignity and honor. But it's not only, he said, very important for Egypt, it's important for the whole world. Why is that? Because restoring the dignity of Egypt and the rule of the pharaohs in Egypt and the worship to the Ra God right there, the restoring of the might of Egypt actually means that Egypt will be ruling the world and will be the anti-Messiah. Wow. And remember that with Egypt, there are Christians, not only Muslims, Muslims, it's a given, but there are Christians and Jews that are deceived. All the interfaith movement is with Egypt and Washington, D.C. Well, so this is what it says. The shaking hand of Yavet Zavot which he's about to wave over it. He's just going to wave his hand. Like he waved his hand in Egypt thousands of years ago during the time of the Exodus and the time of the 10 plagues. And then it says, the land of Judah will terrify Egypt. That's it. You want to highlight something? Highlight that one. The land of Judah will terrify Egypt. The land of Judah will terrify. In other words, Yah is going to use the Israelites, the Israelis that believe in the covenant to terrify Egypt. It says anyone who mentions it will be afraid. In the same way that Yah used the IDF or, to, or the IIF to actually destroy all the fleet of the airplanes of Egypt in six minutes. It's going to happen again, but in a much greater scope because Egypt has been behind all the quantities of barrages of thousands of rockets sent against Israel, keeping Israel always on edge and attacking the settlements and removing Egypt has been behind all of it. And so there's going to be a time when Israel will have enough <coughs> and Israel will rise up Judah will rise up the Jewish people. And on purpose, it says Judah. Why? Because it's the Jewish people. So anyone that comes and says, well, you know, Israel, we could. It's the Jewish people of today that will rise up. And in the same way that Egypt has been terrorizing the Jews through Hamas and Gaza in cahoots with Iran and with Erdogan in Turkey and through Syria and Lebanon and all this conglomerate of powers of ancient kingdoms that are trying to get the upper hand on Israel because they do not want the Messiah to rule because they're full of the spirit of anti-Messiah. So what's going to happen is that now Yahweh will use little Judah to terrorize Egypt in the same way that Egypt has been terrorizing Judah. Wow. Anyone who mentions it will be afraid. Because of what Yahweh's vow has surely, mark that word, surely purpose against it. In that day, five cities in the land of Egypt will speak the language of Canaan. Do you know what's the language of Canaan? Hebrew. So there will be five cities in the land of Egypt that will speak Hebrew. Swearing allegiance to Yahweh's vow. Now come the good news. All this shaking. All these terrible happenings to the Egyptians because of the establishing of the Egyptian pharaonic empire again and the rise of the anti-Messiah within Egypt trying to rise itself above the Messiah. Then the good news, it says, is that five cities would have been humbled enough to speak Hebrew, <laughs> the language of Canaan, swearing allegiance not to Ra, not to Sisi, not to the globalists, not to the Freemasons, not to anybody. Swearing allegiance not to Lucifer, to Yahweh Tzvaot, the God of Israel. One used to be called the city of the sun. One used to be called the city of the sun. Which one is that? The new administrative capital of Egypt, the city of the sun, the city 
In that day, there will be an altar to Yahweh in the middle of the land of Egypt and next to the border, a pillar to Yahweh. It will be as a sign and a witness to Yahweh Tzvaot. Now, in some, uh, in some um, translations, it says a city of destruction. Why? Because the city of the sun, the city where the sun God is being worshipped, it's a city of destruction. In other words, that administrative capital of Egypt will be utterly destroyed. And whoever is left, the remnant that will be left, will swear allegiance to Yahweh Zvaot, to the God of Israel in the land of Egypt and the city of Cairo. Also, whoever is the remnant that is left will be speaking Hebrew and swearing allegiance to Yahweh Zvaot, the God of Israel. So there will be even a pillar next to the border of Egypt. And it will be very interesting to see where the border is going to fall. Because right now the border with Egypt is in Eilat, the city in Eilat on the Red Sea. And that is the border uh, with Taba, which is the, the, you know, the, the, the passing of the border, the crossing of the border to Egypt into the Sinai Desert. But do you realize that as part of the peace treaty with Egypt, we actually gave up all of the Sinai to Egypt that we had already obtained legally because they attacked us. So where will that pillar be if the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob up to 1,000 generations is that uh, the promise of the land is from the Nile to the Euphrates? So the border, the pillar at the border will probably be right there in Cairo. It will be at the Nile. In other words, all the Sinai will be given away uh, and all that area all the way to the Nile will be part of the greater land of Israel as promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the pillar that will be set to Yahweh will be as a sign and a witness to Yahweh Tzvaot at the border with the Nile there in Cairo. As a sign and a witness to Yahweh Tzvaot in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to Yahweh, now look, in the midst of all this distress, remember I said that Mitzrayim means the place or the land of double portion, of distress and trouble. So in the midst of all of this terrible distress, they will cry. Who will cry? The Egyptians, that finally their eyes will be open to the deception of their own president, of their own government, and of their own gods. They will finally open up their eyes and they will cry to Yahweh, not to Allah. To Yahweh. I remember when I was, <clears throat> we had a lat prayer tower on the Red Sea. I used to pray towards, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Jordan because from our Eilat prayer tower, we saw all of these borders uh, Saudi Arabia by sea, Jordan and Egypt by land. And I remember I was praying one time to call his people out of uh, the Islamic spirits and out of replacement theology and i saw many 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 dressed in white robes with uh those turbans on their heads and they were all arabs and they were coming out and they were coming to the red sea to to, to get immersed and to get baptized so i believe there's going to be a tremendous revival coming from there but first it will be the judgment and the humbling in other words this is not going to happen without the shaking the judgment and the humbling of Egypt. And then they will begin to cry out to Yahweh, not to the God Allah, not to the sun God Ra, not to any one of those pharaohs, not to Sisi. They will call to Yahweh Tzvaot. They will cry out because of their oppressors. And he will send them a savior and a defender, and he will deliver them. So Yahweh will make himself known to Egypt and the Egyptians will know Yahweh in that day. That is very good news. The good news is maybe that you can, if you're an Egyptian or if you line up to Egypt to replace theology, the best is that you would resist it, reject it, read my book, The Healing Power of the Roots, The Identity Theft, 
get and study with us, to get free, to get washed completely free from replacement theology. We have a, an entire Bible Institute uh, online that can help you to go there, to get cleansed, to get ready for these end time happenings so that you will be on the right side and not on the left side. And so it says that Egypt and the Egyptians will know your vain that day. They will worship with sacrifice and offering. They will vow to Yahweh and fulfill it. So Yahweh will strike Egypt. Listen to this. Yahweh will strike Egypt, striking yet healing. That's good news. So they will return to Yahweh and he will respond to them and heal them. In that day, so we see here that Yahweh will strike, will heal. And it says, in that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrians will come to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. And the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be the third along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth. For Yahweh's vote has blessed, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Wow! So now you got it. Now you got it. Yahweh will have to judge Egypt because they are setting themselves up to be the seat of the anti-Messiah. So he will have to judge Egypt. And after he strikes it, he will heal it. Whoever is left, whatever remnant is left in Egypt, and he will have a nation that he will be able to call my people. Now, you know, I'm the president and founder of the United Nations for Israel. Based on a visitation of Yahweh concerning this organization, an organism, because we are a body of people, that comprises at this point that I'm speaking 27 nations and counting. We even have Egypt represented inside of the United Nations for Israel. And that's a very profound thing that we have at least one representative from Egypt because if we didn't have a representative from Egypt, then there was no contact point for this particular promise to Egypt to come to pass because the entire movement of the United Nations for Israel, that is the true United Nations of this end times, so for the other United Nations is against Israel and is fallen into the valley of judgment and all the nations in it with it. But the scriptures that uh, we are founded on is Zechariah chapter 2, where it says, many nations will join Yahweh in that day and will become my people. And one of these nations is Egypt. And then it says, he will possess Judah as his portion in the Holy Land, the Jewish people. And he again will choose Jerusalem, not Cairo, not the new administrative capital that doesn't have a name yet, or at least they have not uh, yet unveiled the name, so we do not know what it's going to be. Not Washington, D.C. No, it's going to be again Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, the place of the double portion of shalom and well-being that from there will come all of the well-being to all the nations in the same way that 2,000 years ago the well-being to all the nations came from Jerusalem and that was Yeshua the Jewish Messiah. In the same way that it says in Isaiah 2, for the Torah shall come out of Zion and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And it's the same way that we are advised that when Yeshua returns, he will put his feet on the Mount of Olives and then he will rule and reign the nations with a rod of iron if they don't submit from Jerusalem, from the Temple Mount, the seat of his throne. So whatever the anti-Messiah is trying to do to restore the glory of Egypt, to reverse the Exodus story, the Bible is very clear about this. Yahweh is going to judge. And Jerusalem will be the capital of Israel. And it is the capital of Israel, but also the place and the center of the world where about Yeshua rules and reigns from. So all of this is going to happen. Well, beloved, the happenings are not going to be easy going forward. I'm letting you know already in advance, you know, don't... Um, 
Don't fall into the deception of many false prophets that are saying that, oh, well, for sure it's going to be okay. Don't worry. You have nothing. To worry. Well, we have nothing to worry when we put our trust in Yeshua, the rock of ages. We have nothing to worry. That's true. And we shouldn't give in to any kind of fear. But I want you to understand that anybody aligned with the new administrative capital of Egypt, with Sisi, with the new rise of the pharaonic empire over there and the worship of the sun god Ra and everything else, everybody aligned with it will be seriously shaken and troubled with a double portion of trouble. And the best that you can do is repent and go back to the God of Israel because at the end, the holy remnant of uh, Egypt will go back to the God of Israel and will worship the Jewish Messiah and they will be called my people. And so just like I said in the United Nations for Israel, then it talks about the sheep nations that will come about and they are called my people. But they are his people only to the point that they worship the God of Israel and not the sun God. They are his people only to the point where they worship in holiness, in spirit and in truth. They are his people and in the same way every one of us that worships in spirit and in truth according to the parameters of the god of israel we are therefore hallelujah his people and we are therefore going to be sheltered at the time of terrible happenings in egypt we will be sheltered during these terrible happenings in egypt and through egypt to the rest of the world and just like his government sisi's government sent uh, a word that uh, transferring the mummies to the new museum in the administrative capital is actually for the betterment of the whole world that's exactly the opposite it's for the whole world to be actually coming under the rule of the anti-messiah beloved many want to go to egypt right now to visit these amazing happenings and i'm going to tell you something you begin to pray seriously that those in egypt that either have not bowed down the knee to Baal, because there are some in Egypt that have not bowed down the knee to Baal, or those in Egypt that will be spared because they will return to be able to wake up and open up their eyes. And those in the nations that are aligned with Egypt, all the way from the Pope and the Vatican and the millions of Catholics in the world, and the millions of evangelicals that are still steeped in replacement theology, we begin to pray that they will come out of that Babylon. It's not for nothing that Isaiah 19, and I always see in the Bible that there is a conglomerate of three chapters that one is connected with the other. It's a whole picture, three chapters, like a triptych, like a trilogy. Isaiah 19, Isaiah 20, Isaiah 21, very important to watch. When Isaiah walked naked in Jerusalem, it was because of Egypt. He was showing how Egypt was going to become naked. And that was in Isaiah 20, following Isaiah 19. And then in Isaiah 21, it talks about coming out of Babylon and Babylon falling down. So we can see here that this is now coming to pass. Now we're going to end up this thing just maybe with some some things and, and we will send you some uh, links over here so when we are done with the broadcast I may put some links over there that you can go and take a look about the breaking of the false ten commandments on Mount Sinai uh, the mummies you know being transferred the new administrative capital of Egypt um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, actually I, I would like to read this actually I would like to read let me read this little piece here about the new capital it says um, that's from Reuters, okay? It says, the new administrative capital just outside Cairo encompasses Africa's tallest building, a crystal pyramid and a vast disc-shaped palace for Mr. El Sisi, inspired by the symbols for an ancient Egyptian sun god. This is from Reuters. Six years in the making at an estimated cost of $59 billion dollars, it is the grandest in a slew of mega projects being built by a president determined to reshape Egypt. Eight lane highways swoop across the crumbling streets of Cairo. Crumbling. I was in Cairo ministering in the 90s. And let me tell you that I had to walk on piles of garbage to move from one building to the other or from one street to the other. There was a clear separation between the common people 
and the aristocrats that had a lot of money and had buildings and apartments overlooking the Nile. A clear, a clear distinction. Those that overlooked the Nile never saw what was happening inside of the city where millions and millions of Egyptians were living inside of cemeteries. Millions until today, living in cemeteries and, 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 and garbage pilings and sewage going. I'm sure that maybe some things have been improved since the 90s until now. I haven't been in Egypt since then. But I remember that very clearly from the 90s. Now there is an eight-lane highway swoop across the crumbling streets of Cairo, skirting ancient tombs and the pyramids of Giza. Giant bridges, freshly built, span the Nile. A new summer capital gleams on the Mediterranean coast just outside the city of Alexandria. So we can see it goes all the way from Cairo to Alexandria. Okay. So I'm going to read now some things that I received from a, a Messianic Egyptian intercessor, okay? And she says this, I told you in picture form, that's the most effective way to do it. A picture tells a thousand words. You of all peoples needs to know this. That's why when I heard what you're all about, I connected strongly with you. You go after anti-Semitism and idolatry and sadly not many do, okay? This is an Egyptian intercessor. Egypt, she said, is the root of idolatry, anti-Semitism and replacement theology, the root of it. And I'm going to send you some links. It is like the book of Exodus replaying these past two years in Egypt. It's like the globalists want to relieve it but change the God wins part. So that's replacement theology at its height. Our churches are rampant with replacement theology. So yeah, if the church does not repent, what do we expect? We made way for this replacement theology abominations. Well, God will not be mocked. And if they insist on throwing their fist up at him, then he will make a mockery of the gods of Egypt. Again, just like the first time eh, during the Exodus and every time after that, he raised up Pharaoh to display his glory. I think that would definitely sum it all up from an Egyptian intercessor. Beloved, I also want to read what they spoke about, in, especially when they broke the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. This is what was declared by those interfaith people and globalists concerning the climatic changes with the fake Ten Commandments on top of Mount Sinai. It says, today, as faiths put aside their differences, in a common call for climate action, we work towards a new covenant for mankind. Replacement new covenant. A new covenant for mankind in the name of of the protection of our common home and for the betterment of our shared human future. So this is what was said by video link from the COP27 27 confabulation. We're going to send you that also so that you will say. Is to save the earth through climate control the answer? Is replacing the Ten Commandments pleasing to Yahweh? It says in the word of God. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. In unrighteousness, they suppress the truth, claiming to be wise, they become fools. They traded the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creation rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Romans 1, 18, 22 and 25. When it says worshipping the creation, it includes the worship of the foreign, the fallen gods, because you need to realize that all these fo fallen gods that they are worshipping are created. They are the fallen angels that already from the book of Genesis we see they fell and mated with the daughters of men and procreated children that were hybrids. The hybrids exist until today. And most probably they are being put on the heads of nations. Just a little thought right there. They exist until today because even after Noah's deluge, after the... Um, Noah destruction of the world at the time when Yah destroyed the world with water, there was again same happenings of fallen angels mating with the women of men, and that's why there were giants in Canaan, 
and that's a reason why they kept on showing up and even the Amalekites for example was one of those hybrid races and they even showed up all the way to the Persian Empire during the time of Haman and Queen Esther and so this has continued this has continued working on this mixy this mix hybrid but again that's a subject for another video which you probably will find right here among my videos as well and so beloved one let's take a look at the end of the book okay the end of the book the end of the book is the book of revelation we're going to read what is written in revelations 8 7. it's when the shofars are blown the first trumpeted and there was hail and fire mixed with blood and they were thrown upon the earth a third of the earth burned up a third of the trees burned up and all the green grass burned up here goes all the globalist climatic agenda right then and there because they have chosen to worship the creation rather than to worship the god of the creation the god of israel and her messiah the jewish messiah yeshua so now when we talked about this i'm going to see here that there is there's a few things spoken about concerning this climatic agenda redemption and new covenant so you can say that there is a replacement redemption through climate control and a new covenant of the people of the earth with the earth our covenant is with the god of the earth it is through him that we can be better stewards and indeed we are called to be better stewards of the earth we are called to care for what has been given into our, heart, into our hands to care, but never to put it as the center stage of the problem and never to put it as the center stage of our attention. Why? Because really, if you think about it, the problem is idolatry. The problem in this world is not that we are destroying the earth. We are destroying the earth because of idolatry. And not only that, but the one that is in charge of the world's climate is Yahweh himself. He is the one that's in charge of the winds. He's in charge of the storms. I've got an entire book called Stormy Weather. Please read that book and you will see that every time there was unbiblical politics done in the United States against Israel, there was a terrible storm happening in America normally within 24 hours from the unbiblical move of America against Israel. As Mr. Biden has been attacking this present day government in Israel, as he's been trying to stop the settlement of the land of Israel, together with all the other globalists and the Abrahamic Accord people, then I'm going to tell you what's been happening in America. The worst snowstorm in a hundred years, all over California, the west coast of america and on the northwest and all the way to the southwest storms tornadoes that have left many dead and that is because yahweh has poured out storms every time that the government of america tries to stop israel from possessing the land that has been promised from the beginning to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob unto 1,000 generations. And he's returned us back to the land to possess the land and to return to the God of the land. Well, so anybody that puts themselves on the side of this climatic agenda is actually putting themselves into a replacement new covenant and a replacement redemption that you want to be green and you want to make sure that things are, uh, you know, done well on the earth, it's very nice. But if you put yourself in cahoots with this climatic agenda that saw this unholy alliance on top of the, well, recognized Mount Sinai, though we believe probably wasn't there, you have put yourself in alignment with the anti-Messiah agenda and with the rise of Egypt as the seat of it. The best that we could do is play, pray. And this is what this Egyptian intercessor is telling us today. Please pray for us as Egyptian believers and leaders who stand for our nation. Egypt belongs to Elohim, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he will have it 
and they will pledge allegiance to the true and living God. Before that happens, there needs to be a deep and genuine repentance that only he can put on us. Please pray for the spirit of intercession and the spirit of teshuvah repentance to be heavily on us as priests who stand before him. Please pray for us an understanding of his redemption plan that has the nation of Israel and the people of Israel at the heart of it, all over it. The understanding and burden to join his heart in bringing his people home to marry the land that he has given to them. That is the heart cry of a true Egyptian intercessor that has repented from replacement theology. And our prayer today is exactly what she asked for. We ask that Yahweh will pour out a spirit of grace and supplication over all of those that are his priests in Egypt. I pray in the name of Yeshua that everyone that belongs to you in Egypt and yet is still in deception will be able to come out of deception because an all-encompassing brokenness and repentance and being willing to risk everything for the truth in Egypt in Yeshua's mighty name. So we release that today and we will release that with the blood of the shofar. And this is what she continues saying, this Egyptian intercessor. Egypt is still rampant with replacement theology and anti-Semitism in our churches and in our nation. We have aligned ourselves and bought into the vicious lies and propaganda that has gone out against his people Israel. We have been so harsh on them when rather we should be indebted to them. And this is about the Christians, not even the Muslims. We have called them stiff-necked and cursed them with that constant declaration and forgotten that God himself blinded them so that we could have the gospel. That's what Romans 11 says. Blindness in part has come to the Jews so that salvation will come to the Gentiles so that we, the Gentiles will cause the Jews jealous to have their Messiah back. But replacement theology Christians have not caused any jealousy. We have not aligned with all his covenants to Israel. We have not embraced the Abrahamic covenant about the land. We have not come humbly before him and celebrated his fulfillment of his word to Israel in bringing them home to the land he has given to them and their fathers. Second Chronicles 6.25 We have not delighted in his law. Psalms 19.7-11 Our churches and our nation continue to speak against his beloved people. Please, she says, this Egyptian intercession. Pray for the remnant, that we would be multiplied and that we will be unified. Father, let it be so. Let them be multiplied and unified because they all come out of replacement theology and they become one in Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, Jew and Gentile as the one new man, are completely free from replacement theology, grafted in the same olive tree uh, of Israel and not the Christmas tree. Let them be multiplied and be unified in the truth. Just like you said in John 17, when you said, sanctify them with the truth, my word is truth. Pray that he will call a solemn assembly. And we're going to blow the shofar for that solemn assembly to be called. Where we truly and deeply weep between the porch and the altar, rending our hearts and not our garments. For as long as it takes days, weeks, months or years, but that we won't get up until it is done, until he is done until Yahweh is done please pray that he gives us his heart for Israel that he gives us his zeal for Zion amen pray with that please pray that he imparts to us understanding of his redemption plan with the nation and people of Israel at the center of it let it be so please pray that any sense of nationalism will get down and be replaced and repented of and that he will put in us a desire and longing to contend for the fullness of today's Israel to come into her full inheritance and destiny. That's what the United Nations for Israel is all about. So I'll call forth many Egyptians that belong to Yah to come into the United Nations for Israel. Join us. Because that's exactly what we're doing and you will not be alone, but you will have all the equipping that is necessary for you to be able to do it in this nation especially my GRM Video Bible Institute will absolutely change your life. You need to be prepared for this. You cannot have an ounce of replacement theology inside so that you can fight with authority. So I call you to come in.
I call all these Egyptian intercessors, all these Egyptian saints that are really belonging to Yah, to Yeshua. I call you to come into the United Nations for Israel. I call you to come and get equipped for the battle. I call you to be able to actually, when you go through my Bible school, you will go through repentance and you will learn and you will be able to weep between the porch and the altar because you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. So I call all of you to come in. Hallelujah. And, and for a whole group of GRM Bible school to be planted in Egypt. Yes, to be planted right there among you. And for a whole United Nations for Israel group of people to rise up in Egypt as members of UNIFI, the United Nations for Israel, united and empowered to do the battle of these end times for the sake of your own people. Because as you stand in the gap in the right way, with acts of restitution towards Israel, which the United Nations for Israel teaches the people on how to do it. As we are planting orchards in different parts of the land, we are doing projects in the land, standing together with those that are fighting for the land to fulfill the promises of Yah, and in prayer, and in action, both things, then, then Yah will have great mercy because you will be putting the key of Abraham in the open position. The key of Abraham is Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you. Paraphrase, it actually means that Yahweh will bow down his knee before those that bow down their knee to bless, to favor, and to prosper the people of Israel. And then he says, I will curse those who curse you. It's two a Hebrew words that says, I will declare a word of complete destruction and annihilation to all of those that take Israel lightly. Like you would take lightly a parent, because Israel is the mother of the nations, not Egypt, Israel. So when the saints in Egypt bow down their knees to recognize Israel as the mother of the nations, and to connect with us, the United Nations for Israel, they will be able to stand. And I truly believe at this point there is no other organization that has the equipping that we do. For the mere reason that Yahweh has downloaded on me a special tool to be able to get you rid of replacement theology. That is my job, that is my assignment, and that's what I've been doing for 33 years where other people don't dare to touch it and don't dare to say the truth because they're afraid of men even when they know it. Yahweh has chosen me to teach you to equip you so that you can fight for the sake of your nation. He hasn't done it for my sake. He's done it for your sake. And yes, of course, it goes through blessing Israel, through making acts of restitution concerning Israel. I am a Jew, I'm an Israeli, I'm an American as well. But uh, as a contact point, the purpose is to take you there, to take you to that place where you can have a people, a holy remnant in Egypt, and in every other nation of the world, so that the promises of Yah can come to pass and you can be called my people. Hallelujah. So, praise Yah. You can see here that she's longing for her beloved Egypt to line up with the purposes, the covenant purposes of God for Israel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are coming to the end of this, but I'm going to read another part of Revelation as we're coming to the end. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. I want you to keep that in mind, silence in heaven for about half an hour. When you go to Zechariah 2, the last verse of that chapter that talks about the sheep nations that are called my people, on which Israel is called to be, uh, Egypt is called to be one of them, and the possession of Yahweh, which is Judah, the Jewish people in the Holy Land, and Jerusalem as his city and capital, his address on earth, then in that same chapter, it ends with, be silent all flesh before Yahweh, for he has risen, from his holy habitation. Yahweh is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He has risen from his holy habitation and he calls all of those that have other political ideas and other opinions to shut up, to absolutely shut up. 
If you have other opinions of what the Bible says, of what the word of Yah says, of his covenant promises, simply shut up because he's risen from his holy habitation. And he says here that when the lamb opened the seventh seal, it's Yeshua himself, the Passover lamb that opens the seals of judgment. By one Jew, the whole world can be saved. And by one Jewish Messiah, the whole world will be judged. It's the same Jew, beloved. How do you think he will judge those that harbor replacement theology, anti-Semitism, worship foreign go gods in the guise of Christian feasts, harbor jealousy in the hearts against Israel, attack Israel verbally, align themselves with the United Nations or with the happenings in Egypt? How do you think he will judge them? Well, it says this, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour because the Lamb opened the seventh seal. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven shofars were given to them. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden incense burner. He was given much incense to offer up along with the prayers of all the saints of the Kedoshim, the Holy Ones, upon the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the Holy Ones rose before Elohim from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the incense burner and filled it with the fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were clashes of thunder and rumblings and flashes of lightning and earthquakes. Then the seven angels holding the seven shofars prepared to sound them. The first shofar trumpeted and there was hail and fire mixed with blood and they were thrown upon the earth. This is exactly the same happenings as in the first exodus. A third of the earth burnt up, a third of the trees burnt up, and all the green grass burnt up. There goes the climatic agenda. The second angel trumpeted, and something like a huge mountain ablaze with fire was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. Again, the plagues from Egypt happening in the end of times when Egypt is trying to reverse the story. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the creatures living in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Here goes the climatic agenda. The third angel trumpeted and a great star fell from the heavens, burning like a torch. It fell on a third of the rivers and of the springs of water. Here goes the climatic agenda. Now the name of the star is Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood. That's bitter. And many people died from the waters that were made bitter. The fourth angel trumpeted another shofar and a third of the sun and a third of the moon and a third of the stars were struck so that a third of them were darkened. Here goes the sun God and the moon God, Allah. So that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day would not shine as well as a third of the night. Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying out with a loud voice as it flew high in the sky saying, woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blast of the shofars, the three angels are about to sound. When we started this new biblical year, the word was blow, 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 blow your shofars. Why? Because we are preparing the world for the blowing of the shofars from the book of Revelation. Because as we blow on earth, the shofars from the angels of Yah will answer us. And right now, he's releasing judgment over all that aligns with Egypt. And he releases true redemption and new covenant to all that aligns with the Jewish Messiah Yeshua and his covenant promises to his people, Israel, the Jewish people of today. In Yeshua's mighty name. Oh!